Guns for General Washington. Chapter 9. News and Rumors. Somewhere across town, church bells began to ring. Finishing his breakfast of biscuits and cheese, Paul listened. That would be King's Chapel, he decided, over on Tremont Street. Probably a funeral for another smallpox victim. These days, the bells tolled often for the dead. The pox was everywhere, striking people without regard for their politics or for history. Tory and Whig, royalist and neutral, everyone was fair game for the deadly sickness. Gone away, moaned the church bells. Gone away, gone away, gone away. Paul gathered the leftovers of his breakfast and put them in a tin box. Nobody in Boston wasted a single bit of food, no matter how small it might be. Farewell, cried the bells. Farewell, farewell. In the old days, Paul thought church bells had sounded different. He loved to hear them calling across the rooftops. Even on sad occasions, they rang out strongly, serenely, full of life and hope. Now it seemed they were always dull and gloomy as if mourning for a dying city. Paul pulled on the jacket, grabbed his cap, and slipped out of the house, locking the door behind him. Crossing Fish Street, he passed a company of redcoats standing at rest. Their muskets slanted carelessly every which way. Sullen and bored, they glared at Paul with cold eyes. The boy looked the other way and tried to appear small and unimportant. He hated the British for making him feel weak and fearful, and despised himself for giving in to those feelings. Take care, warned the bells. Take care, take care. He walked quickly past Van Hall Street, once the main public market, now a barracks for housed marines. Partway down Merchant's Row, he turned and walked out on Long Wharf. This great pier stretching 2,000 feet into Boston Harbor was a wonder of engineering admired all over the colonies. Once it had been a busy meeting place, the center of Boston shipping trade. Here in early days, contracts were signed and precious cargoes bought and sold. Along the north side of the wharf were warehouses, shops, and business offices. The south side of the pier had been left free for the docking of sailing ships. Even at low tide, the wharf could handle the biggest schooners on the Atlantic Ocean. Today, as usual, the berths were unused, except for a small cutter flying the British flag. The shops and offices were dark and empty. Some of them had been boarded up for safety, but the planks had been torn off long ago and used for fuel, and so had the furniture inside. Here and there on the pier, Paul saw small groups of people, their faces worn and their clothes shabby. With Boston trapped in Howe's blockade, Citizens often gathered on the wharf to hear the latest news and rumors. Paul moved among the different groups, searching for a face. His eyes brightened. Near the south end of the pier, he spotted old Toby sitting against a wooden piling, holding a fishing pole. When Toby showed up on Long Wharf, it usually meant interesting gossip. Paul strolled over and sat next to the boatman, his long legs hanging over the platform. Without turning his head, Toby touched his battered, shapeless hat. The hat had once belonged to a ship's captain, and since Toby was a man of the sea, he felt entitled to wear it. Morning to you, Master Paul. Paul nodded. Morning to you, Toby. How are you faring? Toby made a face. Well enough, thank ye, except for an empty belly. You might have some luck with your fishing, Paul said. The old boatman shrugged. I've got a powerful fat worm on my hook. Mayhap, I'll catch a bit if the redcoats haven't fished the harbor clean. They sat for a while side by side, and Paul waited patiently. When Toby had news, he would share it in his own way, in his own good time. He moved the pole about in the water, then cleared his throat. Did you ever hear tell of a Captain John Manley? Paul nodded, curious. Privateer, isn't he? Licensed by the council to go after British vessels? Toby grunted. Aye, that he be. Commands an armed brig called Lee. 
Words come that he captured a British supply ship, the Nancy, out on Boston Bay. Took the ship, put a prize crew aboard, and sailed her into Cape Ann. Washington sending four companies to get the cargo and carry it down to Cambridge. Were there good pickings, Paul asked. The best, lad. The Nancy was carrying munitions. Two thousand muskets, plenty of round shots, flints, musket balls, even a grand 13-inch brass mortar. When they hauled the monster ashore, General Putnam christened it with a flagon of rum. Paul smiled. A 13-inch mortar? Lord, wait until the British get a taste of that. We'll have a long wait, Toby grumbled. There's an area enough powder to fire it. The boy frowned. For weeks now, he'd heard rumors that the army was very short of gunpowder. One more battle and the supply would be gone. It was worrisome if the rumors were true. Words come, Toby added, that powder's on its way from France and Spain, and a new powder mill's being built in Canton. Your pa's been put in charge, and he's got old Jim Otis, the powder master, to help him. But it'll be months before they're turning out enough to supply everyone. Silently, they watched the British patrol frigate as it beat its slow way across the harbor. Then Paul asked, Any news of my friend Will Knox? Toby spat into the water. He looked around carefully before answering. Then he grinned. He and the colonel have took themselves off to Fort Ticonderoga. They're aiming to collect the cannons up there and bring them back to headquarters. Paul was surprised. The Ticonderoga cannons? So that was the colonel's secret plan, and a mighty clever one. Those big guns, he said, will be useful when they get here. Toby shot him a grim look. If they get here, lad, if. Paul bridled. I'm not worried. The colonel will have many a good hand with him. The boatman nodded. Aye, but the one he needs is the hand of providence. Later, walking home through the dreary streets, Paul heard the church bells again. The mournful ringing troubled him. Old Toby wasn't very hopeful about Colonel Knox's journey. It did seem a bit daft, Paul admitted, well nigh unworkable. He turned and looked toward Charleston and the Mystic River. Somewhere miles beyond Boston, his friend Will was helping to haul cannon over the mountains to save the rebel cause. It was a dangerous mission and a daring one, but would it succeed or would it end in failure? None can say, chimed the bells. None can say, none can say. And we'll read chapter 10 next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.